Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar entitled The Adolescent Girls Empowerment Program, What Works, What Doesn't, and What's Next for Girls in Zambia. This is a webinar being run by the Gender and Positive Youth Development Community of Practice, the Youth Power. My name is Chisina Kapungu and I work with the International Center for Research on Women and I am one of the co-champions for the Gender and PYD COP and I will facilitate the session. Just to give you some information about the COP, um, we seek to promote um, gender integration and youth-focused programming. Our goal is to provide collective sharing and learning tools and resources to development practitioners so they can better promote gender equality in their programs while also engaging in issues. If you have any issues with the sound, please let us know by writing in the chat box. We will also have a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. For that, we encourage, as you listen to the webinar, to type the questions in the chat box. I will read the questions at the end of um, Dr. Uh, Austrian's presentation during the Q&A. I would like now to introduce Dr. Karen Austrian, who will share lessons learned from the Alice and Girls Empowerment Program. Karen Austrian is an associate at the Population Council who leads projects designed to empower girls in East and Southern Africa. She develops, implements, and evaluates programs that build girls' protective assets, such as financial literacy, social safety nets, and access to education. Dr. Austrian is the principal investigator of two large longitudinal randomized trials evaluating the impact of multi-sectoral programs for adolescent girls. Karen, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for doing the webinar today. Thanks, Chisina. Um, and hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm calling in from Nairobi and so it's really a pleasure and um, I appreciate the chance to share uh, a bit more about the Adolescent Girls Empowerment Program, um, what we've learned so far about what works and what doesn't and what we're doing with this information. Um, so I'll share a bit and I'm also really looking forward to questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, so first, I want to thank um, UK Aid and uh, DFID, who with funding from the UK government, um, and this otherwise this study and this program wouldn't have been possible. The government of Zambia, which has been a key collaborator and partner, our other implementing partner um, collaborators, the Young Women's Christian Association of Zambia, as well as NatSave, um, which is a, um, the National Savings and Credit Bank of Zambia, and also a real um, appreciation. I've been fortunate to work with a great team, um, uh, including the names that you see here, Dr. Hewitt, Dr. Soler, Jean Digitale, Natalie Jackson Hachonda, and we have dozens of program staff and um, research staff who, without them, this wouldn't be possible. Um, just a bit about Population Council before I get started. So the POP Council is a research organization that conducts biomedical, social science, and public health research around the globe. Um, and we take real pride in using evidence to um, come up with solutions that we hope will then lead to more effective policies, um, programs, and health technologies. Um, the Council has quite a global portfolio of programs focusing on adolescent girls. So we work in all of these different countries, um, some which are our own programs that we're involved in designing and implementing and evaluating. In some places, we use the body of evidence um, that we have and um, the lessons learned that we've come up with to provide technical support um, to others to really expand their portfolio of evidence-based girl-centered programming. Um, we have um, 
a very large global body of randomized control trials that are currently going on to really help us identify what works for girls, um, where, why, and at what cost. Um, and so this study in Zambia is one study of a global portfolio that currently have um, over 50,000 girls enrolled in randomized control trials. So what is AGAP, the Adolescent Girls Empowerment Program? So AGAP was designed to provide um, a multi-sectoral asset building program. And the goal is really to help adolescent girls go from being girls into young women in a way that's healthy, that's safe, and that's productive. Um, in order to do that, we we need to look not just at health or at their economic situation or at education, but to really take a multi-sectoral approach. Um, another key feature of the program um, is that it's designed for the most vulnerable girls in Zambia. And I'll talk about how we went about defining vulnerability and selecting and inviting girls based on um, sort of certain dimensions of vulnerability. And the other thing that I think is unique about AGAP is that it is both a program, but there is a rigorous evaluation wrapped around it so that we really have scientific data um, that is helping us to unpack and to understand what works. Um, and then beyond that, not just stopping at, at what works or what doesn't work, but understanding at what cost. Because ultimately, as I said, Excuse me. Our goal is for this, um, for our evidence to be useful for policymakers. And if you don't know how much something costs or what the comparative cost um, effectiveness is between different kinds of interventions or intervention components, then your evidence is less useful um, for policymakers, for to donors, for making decisions about scale as such. Um, so this program began in 2012. We piloted in one urban and one rural site for a year. Um, and then we began our research um, in 2013. We started with a household listing um, and then did baseline data collection in each of our 10 sites. So we started um, the baseline data collection in July and then in each site as we moved on, the intervention started. So in the first site, um, we started in August, in the second site in September, so on and so forth, such that by March of 2014, all 10 sites were operational. Um, we collect data on an annual basis um, for the two years of the program. So um, the first site ended in mid-2015, the last site ended in early 2016, um, and we will be collecting data through to the end of 2017. So we have two-year post-program follow-up. Um, the girls' ages, when we started, all of the girls in the program and in the research sample were 10 to 19 years old. Um, and at the end of the program, they were 12 to 21 and, and in our midline. And at the end of the follow-up, they'll be 14 to 23. So um, on the one hand, we do have quite a wide spectrum um, of age and years to observe the girls. On the other hand, the sample is still quite young and a, a significant proportion of the sample hasn't yet made all of the key transitions that adolescents go through. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting on today is based on our midline evaluation. So um, this was data that was collected through to the end of 2015 that we spent most of 2016 analyzing. And so at the time of this um, this data that I'm going to present today, uh, our sample is 12 to 21 years old. So as I mentioned, we were working in 10 sites, um, five urban and five rural, and they were spread in f across four provinces in Zambia. Um, and this was done to try to get a representation um, while at the same time balancing the realities of conducting um, a four-arm randomized control trial, so not wanting to go to the far-flung corners of the country. The theory of change um, that we used when we were designing the intervention um, was based on the asset building theory of change. So really focused at the level of the girl. And um, this theory is based on 
the idea that girls need a combination of social health and economic assets in order to make that transition into um, adulthood in a way that's healthy, safe, and productive. So the different intervention components were geared toward, um, in the medium term, helping girls to build those different assets in those different categories. Um, and then in the longer term, the hypothesis is that those assets would translate into a range of longer term outcomes um, on looking at increased schooling completion, a range of sexual and reproductive health outcomes such as delaying sexual debut, reducing early marriage and gender-based violence, um, as well as STI um, and HIV transmission, specifically looking at HSV2, which is genital herpes. So. Um, I'll talk a bit more in detail about what the different intervention components were, um, but at its core were safe space mentoring sessions where girls met and got a range of content, um, and that really feeds into all three asset categories, whereas um, savings accounts and financial education focus on economic assets, and the SRH education as well as health vouchers fo focused on building health assets. So let me break apart the three key intervention components um, and talk a bit about um, what they were and how it worked. So the core of AGEP, as I mentioned, were safe spaces or girls groups. And this was implemented in partnership with YWA, sorry, YWCA of Zambia. And this intervention, the girls met weekly over the course of two years. So in total, each group had po possibly about 100 meetings. Um, and the groups were segmented such that there were younger girl groups, older girl groups, and in places where there were enough girls who were already married or who were already mothers, there were separate groups for um, married girls or young mothers. And we do this because we, um, we really wanted the girls in the group to be as similar as possible. Um, there's really a big difference, not only in life experience, but also the way they learn. If when you compare 11 year olds and 18 year olds, the content was varied between younger girls and older girls. Um, so that's been a key strategy um, of safe spaces that's been implemented in, in multiple different contexts through POP Council programs. Another key feature of the safe spaces is that they're led by a female mentor. So this is not peer education. Um, the literature uh, does not point very favorably on peer education um, having strong positive effects on adolescents in the groups themselves. Um, so we look to recruiting slightly older um, women from that community. So they're old enough that the girls can look to them um, to see them as role models, but not quite so old that they're not comfortable opening up um, to these women and we went through a pretty intensive recruitment process um, where there, like a job description was posted, they had to apply um, and we were looking for women who had completed secondary um, school, were, limit, were literate and um, had past experience um, in terms of facilitating groups, most with sexual and reproductive health content before. Um, and these were paid mentors, so they made the equivalent of about um, 50 US dollars per month. Uh, then, so the safe spaces groups really serve as a platform or creating a platform in which girls are brought together um, and and their social sort of social assets are built, they form relationships with one another, and then the content of those groups can really be varied. So AGAP, over the course of two years, covered quite a wide range of topics, um, ranging from a full range of sexual and reproductive health topics, including puberty and um, family planning and safe motherhood and um, family planning, I think I said that, and also life skills. And then there's also a financial education curriculum that they, they got, which focused on money management, um, so how to save um, how to save, how to set savings goals, how to budget, uh, etc. Um, and then we had embedded into the larger study a sub-study um, testing the a nutrition curriculum. So I'm not really going to talk about that today, but half of the mentors were randomly selected to be trained and then implement in their group six um, nutrition sessions as well.
So um, one of the things that we did in the um, safe spaces groups was collect um, very detailed attendance data. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we ended up using that data um, in, from the research side. But basically, our uh, mentors each were given a very basic, probably the most basic smartphone that was available on the market. And using Open Data Kit or ODK, they, um, on a weekly basis, they would take attendance. So they would input information. And this is um, what the app look like. So they would input information both about the date and the time of the meeting, but also which curriculum they were using, including down to the specific session. And then they would mark um, which girls in their group were there. And the when they connected to network, um, those forms would automatically push into our um, database so that we could see, um, and this is, we linked into what's called the Salesforce platform. Uh, we built a platform on that. And so this is a meeting record. So we could see the time, the session covered, how many girls came, and then they also took a picture. So we knew they weren't just um, making up the data. And from a programming perspective, um, we found that this was incredibly useful to monitor the quality in real time or as in close to real time as possible because staff, um, the way the program was staffed, we had staff in Lusaka and we also had um, site coordinators based um, at each site. And regardless of whether they were in the capital or in one of the sites, they could come into work on Monday morning, look in our database and see who met over the weekend, um, who didn't, did they do the right session, um, uh, was there a serious drop in attendance or not and follow up immediately as opposed to relying on paper registers where by the time the data actually gets to someone to see something or to be able to do something about it probably two or three months have gone by um, by the time it's sent up to the capital, it's entered, it's analyzed, it's looked at. And so this really gave us a tool on a weekly basis to monitor the quality of the program. Um, I'll talk later about how we were also, um, all of this data is linked to individual girls. So we were then able to use it to um, assess sort of how heavy program participation mediated the impact of the program results. So the um, second intervention component is the health voucher. Um, and this was a scratch card. So sort of like um, airtime or talk time, the cards a little bit bigger than those cards, um, but the panels on the back were scratch panels and behind each one was a code. And it was linked to an SMS platform. So we contracted in each of the 10 sites with um, government facilities as well as private facilities and other NGO clinics. Um, in most of the rural sites, uh, all of the clinics were public because there was no, um, private or NGO facilities available except for in one in one site um, but otherwise uh, we so then each provider uh, had a code and had a very simple phone not even a smartphone and when girls came in with their voucher they would SMS in a series of codes with, that are the girl's number and the um, the girl's ID number and the voucher number and the service that she wanted and then immediately the system would spit back um, an approval or an authorization to go ahead the service would be provided then they would scratch off the panel on the card and enter that and that would trigger um, payment in our system. We, uh, the services that were available was a wide range of general wellness services, so girls could go in for a checkup or also sort of general um, illnesses such as malaria or diarrheal diseases or respiratory infections, um, as well as a full range of sexual and reproductive health services, so um, family planning, pregnancy testing, HIV testing, antenatal care, um, gender-based violence counseling, um, post-abortion care, comprehensive abortion care, uh, which is legal in Zambia. So um, really the full suite of services were available um, using the voucher. Uh, the third component was uh, the Girls Dream Savings Account. And here we worked with NatSave, the National um, Savings and uh, Credit, National 
Credit and Savings Bank of Zambia. Um, and uh, we designed a girl-friendly savings account together. And there are a lot of junior accounts in the market, but this account is different because it's really in the name of the girls um, and it is their account. They can deposit on their own and girls who were above the age of 16, um, that's when you can get an ID card in Zambia, they could do all their transactions on their own. Um, girls who were under that age, who are still considered minors, had a co-signer that was necessary for account opening and for withdrawals only. Um, the goal of the savings account was really to promote a savings culture and reinforce the financial education that the girls were getting in the groups um, and to sort of reinforce those money management skills and to help them build um, economic assets. Uh, there was a very um, low sort of minimum opening deposit and that all the transactional fees were waived. And in order to set this up, we had to get a specific um, waiver from the Central Bank of Zambia, which was really helped us in operating this account. So um, let me talk a little bit about how we set up the research design, um, because we wanted to not only understand the impact of the full suite of interventions, but to be able to understand the added benefits of um, the individual components. So um, in our first arm, we had um, girls who were only getting safe spaces. So these girls were participating in the weekly meetings, they were getting health, life skills, and financial education curriculum. Um, our second arm of girls got safe spaces and the health voucher. And our third arm got um, the safe spaces, the voucher, and the bank account. The, um, in addition to that, we had control uh, two kinds of controls, um, and the controls weren't exposed to any pieces of our program. So we had internal controls, which were within our program sites. Um, and then we also, because we were a little bit worried, especially in the urban areas, that um, there would be spillover. Um, and I'll talk about how we defined um, communities and how we decided which girl would be in which arm. So we also had external controls, which were um, matched. So for every site in an urban area, we found a similar site um, in that same city uh, to match as an external control. And I'm not really gonna talk about it um, when I talk about the results, but we did do an analysis to see if um, if there seemed to be a lot of spillover into the internal controls, um, and hence we would need to make more use of the external controls, but we didn't really find a lot of spillover. So um, that was good from, from a research perspective. So as I think I mentioned earlier on, the research objective um, was to determine the impact of AGEP both on the mediating outcomes, so on asset acquisition in the three categories, economic, social, and health, and also looking at longer term um, impact um, on a range of demographic, reproductive, and other health outcomes. So as I mentioned, um, this was a randomized control trial. We used a cluster design. So the randomization was at the level of the community. Um, and then whoever was determined to be an eligible participant within that particular community what, received whatever version of the program that their community was assigned to. Um, <clears throat> All of our participants, as I think I've mentioned, were female. They were 10 to 19, and they were um, they met a measure of vulnerability. So, um, how did we define the study clusters or? the communities, I think cluster is a fancy research word for community. So. Um, we in Zambia, there is what's called a census supervisory area, and those are our CSAs for short, and those are made up of about three to six enumeration areas each. Um, and so those are boundaries drawn by um, the Central Statistics Office uh, in Zambia and what they use in their census. So we, in the urban areas, we basically used um, GIS mapping 
to define which CSAs would be in a particular site. Um, so for example, Mississippi and Chihuahua was one of our urban sites in Lusaka. There was a total possibility of 47 eligible clusters in that site. We needed 16 clusters per site um, and four per arm. And so we held public lotteries with key stakeholders um, in each site. And then the 16 out of 47, for example, in this site were selected and then they were were randomly assigned and it literally was as simple as pulling um, names out of um, out of baskets and and as such so uh, that's how we did it in the urban areas in the rural areas we looked at um, where the health facilities were because we needed to have access to health facilities for the health voucher um, we looked at groupings of three health facilities and drew 15 kilometer uh, radiuses around them. And in all of the CSAs that fell into those concentric circles um, or overlapping circles were is how the site was def defined. And then we held similar public lotteries to pick our 16 um, clusters in each of those sites. So how did we select the girls um, for the program. So we had a target of 10,000 girls uh, over the two uh, to participate in the two year intervention, um, which is about 1,000 per site. And in order to do that, we invited between about 1,200 to 1,400 girls per site, knowing that um, there not everyone would agree to participate or be interested in participating. Um, as I mentioned, our mandate was to reach the most vulnerable girls. And so what we needed to do was come up with a methodology for defining vulnerability. Now, we could have um, chosen all of the girls who had already dropped out of school and gotten married or had children. Um, but if we did that, we wouldn't be able to then determine um, the impact of the program on those outcomes, because those were the outcomes that we wanted to study. So we were looking for what other kinds of markers of vulnerability uh, were associated with those outcomes. And from an analysis, both in the literature, but also looking at our household data, um, what, what became clear was girls that were um, behind in their schooling relative to their age uh, were most vulnerable. So we did an analysis, we ran a regression predicting um, the number of years that a girl was behind in school vis-a-vis -vis her age. Um, and then we took into account some household factors around uh, who was living in the household, were the parents alive, uh, et cetera. Um, and from there, that gave us a ranking, a score that we could rank girls on, and then we selected the most vulnerable in each site. Um, the uh, Sorry, I think it's not one of the links actually that's being shared right now, but um, it is available on the study website. We have a brief that details um, the, the methodology that we use to create the vulnerability ranking. Uh, if for those of you that might be interested in looking a little bit more into detail about how that was done. The other thing that we did, so in any household where there was more than one girl who was 10 to 19, if one of the girls was selected to participate, then we invited all of the girls in the in the household to participate. Um, that was one of the things that we learned from the pilot test, that if you only invited one of the girls in the household, uh, she wasn't very likely to participate because it really upset uh, the typically the mom and the other girls in the house, like, why are you just picking this one girl? So we made that, um, that exception. Now, that was our program sample. The research sample, um, we did not need that many. We wanted, um, our target was to have 3,500 girls after the four years of observation. So accounting for any attrition or any um, loss to follow up that we would experience over the five rounds of data collection. Um, so our sampling frame or our potential research sample was the list of girls who were invited to participate in AGAP and then uh, girls at the CSA level, um, 37 girls per cluster were randomly selected uh, 
to be a part of the research sample. We excluded girls who were already married at baseline for the same reason that I mentioned earlier about those girls were likely had already experienced all of the outcomes um, that we were looking to to have an impact on. Um, but they were still very much eligible um, and encouraged to participate in the program. You can see only about um, a third of the girls in the program were also included in the research sample. Um, and here uh, for uh, we only included one girl per household in, in the research sample. So what kinds of data did we collect? Um, so I'll show you in pictures. This is a picture of one of our research assistants conducting an interview. So all of the data was collected on tablets electronically, uh, which we find improves data quality and reduces human error, um, also reduces the time needed to access your data because it doesn't it doesn't need to be hand entered off a piece of paper. Um, for at the end of the face-to-face -face interview, the, the research assistant gives the tablet to the respondent um, and plugs in headphones and then a series. So we use a CASI um, methodology to ask some of the most sensitive questions about sexual behavior, um, HIV, abortion, and um, sexual violence. We also tested girls um, who were 15 and above for HIV, HSV2, um, and anemia. Um, and then we take height and weight measurements of all of the respondents, as well as any children that they may have under age five. Um, and then in some of the years, we also, this is part of our nutrition evaluation that was embedded into the study. Um, we did um, child development um, assessments. So looking to see, depending on the age of the child, um, of any respondent where they were meeting their developmental milestones and such. So the research timeline, um, as I mentioned, we started with the household listing and then collected data annually. Um, we have now since um, finished our fourth round of data um, and are currently uh, collecting, cu currently working on analyzing that and should hopefully be able to put out um, the results in about two months. Um, and then we will start in July of this year, our final year of data collection. So just to give you a sense of our response rates, and I'm going to be focusing on our first three rounds of data. Um, so we have been able to maintain a 90% um, response rate, which is uh, very good and a lot of work in order to maintain that. So for a sample that is so mobile, um, we really put a lot of work. We track girls no matter where they are um, in the country now. So we, um, while we started, they were all living in four provinces. Our sample is now spread over all 10 provinces. Um, but it is important to us to track those because you can imagine that those that migrate are likely um, systematically different from those that stay. And so we also want to see um, the impact of the program um, on them. Um, we also, when we started, um, there was a bit of a question of what the response would be for the biomarker testing, um, and we had very strong acceptability. So you'll see 90%, 96% um, accepted to be tested for HIV and 95% accepted to be tested for HSV2. Um, and you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, accusations that uh, the program is Satanistic, or a, a, a lot of that had to do with the blood testing. But you'll see that at the end of the day, um, I think it's a very small number of rumors that cause a lot of noise because the vast, vast majority did um, did actually accept to be tested. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about our program monitoring data, um, just to give you a sense of the program uptake, uh, and because um, I think this data is meant to be useful for practitioners just as much as for, for researchers. Um, so one of the things that um, is, I think, very important learning is that 
um, only about a third of the girls attended half or more sessions. So if you recall, there's probably about 100 sessions eligible, so only a third of them um, tested, uh, or sorry, only a third of them attended regularly uh, over, over the course of the two years. Almost half of them attended and joined, but didn't att attended less than 50 sessions. And some of these are girls who attended quite regularly, but then for whatever reason, like before the end of the first year, dropped out of the program. Often it was due to migration, um, or that they just really didn't attend very frequently over the course of the two years. And we have a full quarter of the girls who never attended um, at all, who received invitations and just did not um, attend. And this is after three visits to the household. Um, invitations were delivered by the mentors to the household. Um, and if they didn't come for the introductory meeting where girls registered into the program, two additional visits were made to each household. So um, this is really about uh, Something that we've had to think a lot about is why is it that um, this many girls didn't join the program? Um, we did analysis to try to understand who were the girls that were mo most likely to participate. Um, and we found that um, the girls who were more likely to participate were in school, they were younger, and they were living in rural areas. Um, and also they were the biological daughter of the health head of the household. So they weren't living with the grandparents or with a sibling or an auntie or a friend or something like that. Um, so, and I think when you look at these characteristics, it's, it's the less vulnerable of the most vulnerable that were the least likely to participate. And um, so what is it that we were still missing? And, and I'll talk more about some of our reflections about these in the end. Um, why weren't these girls or participating or, or participating as frequently? I mean, we have some hypotheses about um, in the rural areas, there's one of the things is that there's just a lot less competition for time going on. There's, in most of these places, we were pretty much the only show in town, so to speak. There weren't other opportunities to participate in other kinds of development programs. Um, and so even though girls, uh, when we, we did ask about the average amount of time it took them to get to their groups, so even though rural girls spent twice as long walking to their safe spaces meetings, um, they were more likely to participate. I think also for as girls get older, um, their needs become more complicated. They they have a lot more going on in their lives, and it's possible that they were um, some combination of too busy for the program, but also that the program wasn't meeting their sort of expanded, expanding um, set of needs. Um, gosh, I need to speed up. I'm just looking at the time. Hmm. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so let me go through this a little bit quickly. Um, so this is the 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 voucher usage. Um, so I just want to point out that the uptake of the voucher was actually quite low. Um, so only 21% of the girls used the voucher, um, and that was um, higher amongst the older girls. Um, and of that. Most of the services that they used were for just uh, general wellness or, or non-sexual and reproductive health um, services, although the older girls, understandably so, more likely to be sexually active, were more likely to be using sexual and reproductive health services. So, um, but one thing that we did find that was interesting was that 88% of girls who, who used a sexual and reproductive health service also used a general wellness service. So that bringing girls in for a very wide range of services um, is potentially a bridge to getting them into a place where they could then access sexual and reproductive health services. Um, this is a snapshot of the savings account um, usage. So we did have um, about 50% of the girls, but close to three quarters of them who were active participants did manage to open savings accounts. And this is pretty on par with some of the other programs we've done in other countries with savings accounts. Um, 
And if we want to look at um, about a third of the girls made an additional deposit into their account after opening the account, I think on its face that sounds low. But again, comparing ourselves to other kinds of youth savings account programs um, in other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's pretty on par. Um, the other thing I just want to call out is that um, not very many girls withdrew um, uh, their savings and that really when girls put money into their accounts, it was for the long term. Um, so let me talk about some of our impact results. Um, our primary analysis is intent to treat analysis where we keep everyone um, in the analysis regardless of whether or not they participated at all, participated a little bit, or participated a lot. And as you saw from our participation data, that's going to have an effect if a full you know, quarter of our sample didn't participate at all and another half of the sample only participated um, somewhat. So then we do the secondary analysis um, that's called treatment on the treated and there we we take into account participation um, but we also need to control for because as we saw girls who participated were different from girls who diff didn't participate so we need to control for those factors um, and we also use a, a technique called instrumentation in order to control for unobservable differences so these are things that we don't have data on like resilience, like um, parental attitudes and things like that, that we think really do have an impact on um, the, the way in which the program might impact on these girls. So um, let me just quickly walk you through how to read these charts. Um, so we have the indicators on the left-hand column. Then R2 to R1 is the change between baseline and the first year of the program. R2 to R3 is the change between the first and second year of the program. And R1 to R3 or R3 to R1 is the total impact at the end of the two-year program. Um, a green box means that there is a significant um, result, and a red box means it's um, significant, but actually in in the wrong wrong quote unquote uh, way. So in the in the direction that we didn't um, hypothesize. So what are the key takeaways when we look at um, our sort of midterm outcomes on the social assets? So we do see that um, between round one and round three, there was a 13% increase in girls reporting that they had a safe place in the community. So this wasn't, do you go to your safe spaces groups? But this is asking about, do they have places in the community apart from home and apart from school where they feel safe? And this is trying to get at markers of social isolation, which we know increase for girls as they move through adolescence. So we did have some success in breaking a bit of that social isolation. Um, however, there was no change in gender norms or in girls' acceptability of violence, which was pretty high at baseline and remained high. Um, and I'm going to talk about the sort of what we make of all of this at the end. Um, I'm just going through sort of the key headlines. So there was an increase, um, a significant increase in financial literacy. Um, and that increase doubled when you looked at girls who opened a savings account. So that's sort of getting into our different arms and comparing those who just had the financial education versus those who had um, financial education plus a savings account. Um, so also we saw that there was a 33% increase overall in savings activity. So this is um, girls uh, reporting saving, having saved in the last six months. Um, and again, that increases to 60% for girls who attended financial education sessions and even 113% increase for those who opened savings accounts. And so I think this speaks to um, both the importance of financial education, but that savings accounts, whether or not a girl actually deposited money into her savings account, was a motivating factor for saving and had a pretty significant impact on savings um, on savings behavior. Um, and it it mirrors the way in our qualitative research that girls talked about um, saving up to make a deposit into their savings account. Um, 
And we also saw a similar trend for the amount of savings that they were able to accumulate, whether or not that was um, informal or or formal savings. Um, on health assets in terms of knowledge, we did see um, an increase in um, contraceptive knowledge and general sexual and reproductive health knowledge, um, but uh, it was relatively low to start with and still I think it was a modest increase. Um, it's not to say that by the end girls knew everything that there was to know about sexual and reproductive health. Um, so this I just want to highlight uh, our longer term outcomes. We did start to look at some of our behavioral outcomes. So we saw a 23% decrease in transactional sex. Um, and we also saw an increase in girls reporting um, using a condom at first sex. So for example, when we look only at the girls who had their first sexual experience sometime in between uh, the start of the program and um, our midline, 44% of them used a condom the first time they had sex as compared in who were AGAP girls as compared to 36% um, of the control. However, um, we did not see change at midline um, in terms of timing of sexual debut, marriage, um, pregnancy, educational attainment, or HIV or HSV2 infection. So for the most part, um, there was not yet change in our long-term indicators. Um, so a couple of just general reflections, and then I'm um, sort of out of the corner of my eye, I can see that there's a lot of questions flowing into the, the chat box. I'm trying to ignore them for now, um, but I do want to have time to talk about them. So um, we did look at sort of, I didn't present it, but we looked by age category and by urban and rural, um, and there is a real diversity of impact um, depending on the indicator, but Overall, the trend seems to suggest that younger rural girls got most of the benefit um, from the program. Uh, the I also I'll talk about this more about um, sort of addressing gender norms, but um, and why after two years of participating in an empowerment program, there was really no change in gender norms and girls' sense of sort of gender equitability and acceptability of violence. Um, and one of the things that we have, so we did a lot of work at the community level that was engaging parents and key stakeholders, but it was really about um, getting their buy-in for the program and getting them to support the program activities. But there was not work seeing them as beneficiaries themselves and working to um, address some of the norms that the parents held. Um, in addition, we did some evaluation of our mentors, and we found that even amongst our mentors, um, there was real deep-rooted, um, very conservative gender norms, especially norms around adolescent sexuality, adolescent use of contraception. Um, this is a whole other set of our analysis, but we did find that girls who were in groups with mentors that had more sort of progressive or open attitudes about adolescent use of contraceptives, those girls were less likely to be pregnant. Um, by round three. And so when we're working in communities and in places where the norms, especially around adolescent sexuality, are so deep-rooted um, that we do have to go beyond just working with the girls on um, norms change. Uh, but at the same time, it sort of the safe spaces was a useful platform um, for bringing girls together. So actually, I'm going to skip that slide and do this one, then come back to the other one. So just um, keep in mind that this data is midline data. So the sample is still 12 to 21 at this point. Many of the girls are not even old enough to have gone through these transitions. So we are still awaiting our um, end line results uh, to see if some of the change in the mediating factors and early behavioral change around condom use and transactional sex does in the longer term translate into some of the larger impacts. Um, but we are really seriously taking, uh, like, thinking through what, miss, what we missed in terms of girls sort of communities in which they're working in um, and what needs to be done to address these norms um, 
that are very deep rooted. The other thing is thinking about um, the most vulnerable and as girls get older that perhaps we're not really um, meeting their need to be linked to other economic opportunities and resources um, and that possibly as girls get older a more income generating uh, economic strengthening intervention would be key or especially that just the economic resources of the most vulnerable households aren't being met and so that is preventing program participation in the first place or perhaps in um, thinking about supporting more formal um, education. So actually maybe I'll skip, um, these are just a quick uh, things that did really go well. So having a pilot period helped us to really refine the intervention, um, having staff on the implementation in each site. I talked about our electronic pro monitoring data and how that really helped us keep up the quality intervention. Um, Advice going forward, really looking beyond just qualifications of mentors, but looking at qualities. Um, and we'll be putting out a report on sort of how different dimensions of mentor quality affected program impact in different ways um, and providing a wide range of um, program content. So I will stop and um, just I'm very grateful to a really wide number of people for making this happen. Um, and all of this information is available on the website. So we have our full midline technical report um, with all of the data and all of the different breakdowns. We have a extended executive summary, a program brief, um, and a number, all the other resources from the program are up there, including um, all of the curricula that we used um, and some other methodology and baseline briefs. Karen, for um, that very informative um, presentation, we had a lot of questions in terms of the retention and attendance of the girls. Um, you noted that there was a 90% retention rate, which is quite impressive, especially given that you are dealing with girls that migrated. Um, can you say more about how you keep in touch with the girls who have migrated and what do you think enhanced the tracing of the girls, um, who, especially those who migrated? Mm -hmm. um, so when we do each survey, we take pretty detailed contact information um, from the girl, but also three key contacts, at least one of which is a non-family member. Uh, and then so if a girl isn't at the household when we go back, we have ways to track her. Um, and so I think that's part of it is taking down the information um, and the other part of it is spending the time and the resources to to go and find that. A question about um, your program uptake. Do you take from this data, data that meeting weekly is too frequent for these vulnerable girls and how much content did they miss if they were not attending all sessions? Mm, that's a great question. So I think that is something that we're reflecting on. Um, I don't think that meeting weekly for the younger girls is too much. Um, if anything, I would say that it's the two years that probably it was longer than it needed to be and that the program could have been perhaps um, 12 to 18 months or something like that. Um, but the curriculum was repeated. So there is a high likelihood that perhaps if the girl just didn't come on the day that the topic was um, family planning, first time around, she might be there the second time around. And um, again, uh, regarding attendance, did you find that there were any differences between the girls who attended versus those who did not participate? Yeah, so I talked a little bit about that analysis, and we have um, uh, it, much more detail in the in the midline report about that. But the girls who were less likely to participate were older and living in urban areas, um, out of school at baseline, and um, not living with a biological parent. Of um, gender-based violence. Will you be yeah. assessing impacts yeah, of the intervention on subsequent yeah. GBV victimization and the relationship between economic strengthening and the experience of GBV? Uh, 
Um, so that's another great question. So we do, um, we we are collecting data on experience of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, so we do have, um, we will be able to say sort of, so at midline there wasn't necessarily any, um, any impact on experience of GBV, um, but that's something that we are continuing to collect data on for two additional years and as the girls get older. Um, we haven't yet done an analysis looking at sort of the relationship between economic strengthening and GBV um, experience in this um, cohort. So I'll use this opportunity to put out there that we have a lot of data and there are dozens of research questions that could be answered with our data um, and we are very open to collaborating with others who want to um, conduct additional analyses so whether that happens to be students or other researchers um, so we have a data use policy but feel free to email me and and we can talk about that further because that is a very interesting analysis that should be done, and um, I wish we had more hours. In so the I'm going to ask two more questions in the interest of time. Um, is the conclusion that this intervention had no impact on sexual debut, pregnancy, and marriage? What recommendations do you have to change this scenario? Um, so the conclusion is that um, not at midline so but that it's too early to tell at this point um, because keep in mind that at this current data that i just presented the sample is 12 to 21 so pretty close to a full half of the sample hasn't yet gotten to the average age of um you know first pregnancy and marriage and things like that and the study is powered for the full four years of observation um so i think it's too early to conclude that um i think that like i would be lying if i said that we we hadn't hoped to see some effects at the midline that we're not seeing um and i think that um, I would say some of the things that to get to the part of the question about what would we change about to, to address the scenario. So I think something is needing to, so doing asset building with girls plus working at a community level or household level around norms change, around directly addressing some of the lack of economic resource issues um, that go on at the household that tend to be um, drivers of dropout from school, of early marriage. Um, I think in reflection, if you characterize some of the indicators where we do see change versus the ones that we don't, the ones where we do see change are much more individual to the girl. They're things that she has a lot more control over herself. Whereas, for example, marriage, schooling, those are, um, for especially for adolescent girls, those are not necessarily um, outcomes that she has sole control over. So I think um, you know, next generation of these programs would have much stronger um, complementary household or community components to them. The last question, and we'll definitely send um, the list of questions to Karen so she can respond and send it to the group. Um, how do you ensure project sustainability? Um, that is a great question. So um, a couple of responses. So another thing that I didn't present data on, like I said, we have too much of it, um, is we have an extensive cost effectiveness component. And so we have detailed costing data. Um, and I think that will allow us to determine it once we have our final results. Um, you know, which components of the intervention would we keep and how much would it cost per girl in order to scale it up? Because I think without that costing data, sustainability in the long run is complicated. Um, I think some of the other components working with the various government bodies in Zambia, so working with NatSave, um, that product is now available and there and um, that's not necessarily something that's going away. I mean, we've worked quite closely um, 
with the Ministry of Health on this research study so that they are invested um, in the research results. There was a bit of ministry changes back and then forth the way that we worked for a while with the Ministry of Community Development um, on developing the voucher together. So I think that's another component for sustainability. Um, yeah. And um, maybe I could just say that I, I'm, I'm really sorry that we're out of time and that I don't have time to answer um, the wider set of questions, but I will take the time to sort of write responses that hopefully Youth Power can send to the wider group. But also my email is there and I'm really interested to hear people's thoughts and ideas. So please do feel free to just um, email me um, and we can continue the conversation. Thank you, Karen, for your presentation. It was definitely very insightful. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We will share a link um, for a survey, which if you could complete, we would greatly appreciate it. And we will send you a list of questions. And we encourage you to join our Gender and Positive Youth Development Community of Practice. We'll have more webinars in the future. Thank you.